building a robot not only requires a good muscle, it also requires some way of perceiving the world. And that means the muscle itself needs to know about its own state. We would call that like the proper reception of the robot. And it also needs to be able to perceive the surrounding world through contact, through vision, and through sensing other modalities such as, let's say, heat. And those modalities, they all need to be captured with your robot. So we do have people in the group at least in my group, and I know soft roboticists in the world, they are very interested in this question is, how do you integrate a sensor? What sensor modality to use? How many of them do you need in a single muscle? Or maybe you don't even put them into a muscle, you put them somewhere else in your robotic structure. And then what like, accuracy does this muscle, that this sensor needs in order to reproduce the, the overall state of your robot? So those questions are super important. And as a roboticist, you're looking into them. As a material scientist, you may be not. You may be just focused on the material for a muscle. Or you may be just focused on the material for a sensor. But as a roboticist, you're bringing those two things together. And that's actually what I find most exciting about robotics to begin with, is that we are allowed to have a good excuse to play with multiple interesting technologies to build one intelligent system. In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dweeney, and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. Support for this show comes from Science Robotics Journal. I really find science robotics to be a great resource for reliable and tangible research where we can really push the limit of the science we do in robotics. Great way to stay up to date with the published article is checking out the released monthly issue. All the links will be included in each episode description. We will also happen to have a regular conversation on the most published science robotic articles where also you can contribute with your question and thoughts about their research. Thanks, Science Robotics, for sponsoring Soft Robotics Podcast. Yeah, what are maybe the challenging question maybe still not answered when it comes to robotic design? The challenging question not answered yet. Well, if you look into nature, you have systems that are able to exert large forces very efficiently. So a skeletal muscle... As, as mammalian skeletal muscles are capable of like exerting very strong forces and they can do that while being actually very controllable. At least we can very finely control our arms and legs and really reproducing such an energy, uh, such a power density and also at such a compact size is really challenging from a robotics perspective because we don't have control over just building them out of cells in the size of what animals do. So we typically use non-living materials and we haven't come up with an architecture with a design that really produces an actuator that could challenge what real muscles can do. Mm -hmm. And what do you think may be um, missing to achieve that? It is modeling, understanding. What is a component do you think to achieve that? So in my opinion, it's, three different parts. So the first part is what materials or what combination of materials would make for a strong actuator. And that really boils down to what physics do we want to use for that actuator? Shall it be magnetic? Shall it be electrostatic? Or shall it be like pressure driven? So like fluidic? That's one of the many options there. And then that decides of what materials you want to use for this. And that automatically also causes certain considerations in terms of energy efficiency and conversion of, let's say, electrical energy that you have readily available in forms of batteries into this physical effect of causing a muscle or like a multi-material composite to behave in a contractive way. And that's the first aspect. And the second aspect is once you have that physics principle, you need to come up with a design that allows you to do this in a very compact format and leverage 
the the effects of contraction in such a way that you really get maximized contraction at a small volume. And that really requires to model the effect. And that typically is like a multi-physics problem where you're not just trying to model, let's say, continuous deformations, but you also maybe have fluidics involved in there. So you might combine a, a solid polymer with a fluidic part to cause this muscle to contract. And then maybe you have even electrostatic forces or Maxwell equations, and all of this has to be brought into a modeling perspective. And then the third part is, once you have, let's say, the physics that you want to use there, the kind of physical actuator principle, you've modeled it and you came up with an optimization for this. The last part is how do you properly control it and actually make it contract in such a way that you can make a lag move in a in a controlled manner so it can actually follow a certain path, it can follow a certain motion. I feel those are the three main parts of mm -hmm. of design, modeling, and control. Yeah. Maybe I won't ask you from your perspective, then, so I think it lies on how maybe exhibiting physical intelligence, for example, through material or architecture. Which one do you think is significant when it comes to achieving these goals? Is it through the material or architecture or morphology? Um, so I would say materials right now, we are greatly lacking on still and particularly not just, and maybe we have materials, but bringing them into the right form is also a fabrication challenge, right? So that maybe goes more towards the architecture. If I understand your question correctly, right? So mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, I feel like if you say the word morphology or if you say the word architecture, those things are very related because in the end of the day, I could call a certain design to be an architectural choice or I could call it a morphology, right? But mm. in the end of the day, you can come up with very complicated, very intricate morphologies that are, let's say, even inspired by the skeletal muscle, which acts on micrometer scale or like really small scales where the actual mechanism of contraction in a real human muscle is occurring. Let's say you want to reproduce exactly this architecture you may be able to do this in simulation, but to really build this and fabricate such a system is like impossible at the moment. Like we don't have means of of building a very fine grained architecture where you have multiple parts moving into each other and have forces acting against each other. So that's particularly challenging, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe the question here: Do you think about the control? Since you mentioned it's challenging to achieve certain movement, for example. How do you see me be, because I think you're also interested in the, uh, the fish design and how we can couple, for example, the nonlinearities in the material and geometry. And I don't know, if, do you think about that could be replaced a controller uh, or minimize external controller in more in the direction of the multi-material and the, the shape, how that could be give us interesting features? Yes, I think control well actually i would say control is not so important when it comes down to just achieving at the beginning a, a simple contraction mechanism that fulfills the needs of like high power density and like reasonable range of stroke at a reasonable force profile because that's in my opinion something where control is not so crucial as it is really to just understanding how to provide the energy or the, let's say the electrons, if you do it electrostatically, let's say as an example, let's take an electrostatic actuator. That means where you drive electrical charges into your soft actuator and you then need to drive them away again. So the driving in of those charges and the driving away of this, you could consider to be a low level control problem, but it's more of an electric, like an electrical design or like an electrical component problem of building such a system that can do it. So on a small scale, you really just want to drive the electrons there and you want to get them back again and you want to do that quite efficiently. And it's a little bit of a control problem, but it's way more of an architecture problem. So going back to what you were saying originally, like how do you, achieve this at a fine-grained level so you actually get a good muscle. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is an example when it comes to nature, because you already mentioned at the beginning how we can inspiration. It's very interesting, and maybe you don't understand how this mechanism is working, and maybe you're interested to apply it. Do you have any examples? 
So you're asking for an example from nature that we're not understanding, right? Yeah, maybe why... mechanism, yeah. Well, <laughs> there's tons of examples in nature of we seeing certain deformations. And I mean, the fish is one of the examples I've looked in more detail into, which is the problem of how do you reproduce this like so-called cyclical undulation of a, of a body. So fishes, they undulate continuously their body and they do that through muscle contractions. And they have many of these muscles in, in their body. And every fish has a, a different morphology. I mean, there's, there's fish that can be karangiform or they could have other shapes. And karangiform is the one that I've looked particularly a lot into because it's a design that we've been able to build and somewhat reproduce. And what we don't really quite understand yet is how did nature come up with the arrangement of muscles within these morphologies of these fish morphologies? Like why did they decide to, why did nature decide to put muscles in the way it did? So you could look at it from a mechanical perspective and, and analyze of like, oh, there's a good mechanical advantage of having the muscles be routed in a certain way. And this goes into the field of biomechanics and we can learn a lot from biomechanics, like people investigating what are the biomechanics of a fish. But as long as we can build a muscle that behaves exactly like the fish muscle, these studies are not very helpful because if we can build a, the simple muscle unit in the same way, we will have a hard time to reproduce this full behavior. So what ends up happening is we can build a certain set of so-called soft artificial actuators and they have other contraction behaviors, other like stroke lengths and other force profiles than the real muscle. So then we need to build a different morphology that's actually not the original net, nature's inspired morphology. And that leads us to different design problems altogether because nature doesn't have those artificial muscles. So we can't just copy it one to one from nature. We can't just like take a certain animal, like a certain type of fish and say, we want to like take that design and put this muscle into it. It's the other way. We have that muscle, that actuator that constrains us in what design we can build and what sort of like robot we can build. Mm -hmm. That's a good example. Maybe I'll ask you for the design. Do you think it's more about intuition? Because already using also machine learning technique and maybe simulation here. The first step in the design, what is a significant step you think you have to start with to come up with a design? Uh, the first step is to uh, still, I think, look at what nature has done in terms of different morphologies and different shapes. So... We can, for example, just take a large library of assemblies of different fish body shapes. Could be anything from a stingray to a Nemo to, to a shark. And they give us very different shapes. And we know from an exterior perspective that there has been some sort of optimization done in nature for those shapes. They were maybe optimized for fast swimming or fast turning or even for particularly good camouflaging, right? There could be multiple objectives that nature has actually optimized these species for. And so then you say, okay, we take this as a starting point and now we bring in our ways of building muscles. And again, they're not necessarily the same way as nature has done them, but it's still a good starting point to take these natural examples or these templates and then bring in our artificial muscles into the interior of these exterior shapes. So let's say we have all these different shapes, they have all these different form factors, like a, a flat shape for this manta, or a very sort of a more thin shape for our clownfish, and then we put in muscles. And maybe we have some constraints because we can make the muscle so thin that we can make a very thin fish, or maybe we cannot make it so long that we can make a real size shark. So all of those constraints then also come into place of like, from a systems perspective, what can you even build? Because in simulation, yes, I can probably build anything in simulation. I can postulate, I can build a perfect muscle that contracts perfectly and it can scale to a meter size or to centimeter size. But in reality, we can only build them in a certain scale with reasonable 
amount of resources. So that's mm -hmm. the step I've been at least pursuing in my research. I've been looking into this question of we take inspiration from nature, their different shapes, and we're trying to see how can we train the muscles and get them to swim. Mm -hmm. Great. Maybe I want to ask you in the design of soft robotics, maybe you, there's something maybe you agree or disagree, maybe the view or the design. You still think there's some, maybe I don't agree with this vision and I don't know if you have any certain views maybe you dis disagree with. Hmm. Yeah, so it's a very interesting question. Like what is a view that I agree more and what's a view I agree less? So I think yeah. recently there has been some voices saying, well, is, is soft robotics at this point maybe not fulfilling on its original hopes that when the field was started about a decade ago, it was trying to say, hey, soft robotics is going to revolutionize the field of robotics and beyond. And now 10, 10 years later, we are saying, hey, that may be not the case. And I think people, in my opinion, are probably a little bit impatient in this regard because we have already seen quite some progress been made. And if you look at the overall development of how long electromagnetic motors had been developed until they got into the state where they are today, we are actually, we should be giving exactly at least that much time also to the development of soft muscles. And we should actually just keep pushing the envelope, maybe making incremental progress of answering smaller questions of, let's say, coming up with a little bit better design for the same type of physical actuation mechanism until one day someone comes up with the next breakthrough of like having made a huge design iteration, a huge design iteration that really increases the, the performance of our actuators. And so people have been writing these articles of saying, hey, where are we now? Should we maybe stop being so hyped about soft robotics? I don't agree. I think soft robotics is still the way to go because nature is using soft muscles in let's say a, a mixed soft rigid hybrid skeletal structure and if we start thinking a bit more about this like hybrid setup of like skeletal system combined with muscles we will probably get our robots to be not just crawling little animals soft crawling animals but actually walking animals that still use soft muscles mm -hmm. That's a good point as well. Yeah, maybe I want to ask you in the interesting feature you expect in soft robots, for example, multi-material. I want to ask you your view about multi-material. What are maybe an interesting feature you can get from multi-material? You, because you try to understand the model and explain how this can give us maybe interesting feature. Have you ever thought about multi-material in soft robots? Yeah, nature we already have and you mentioned. But if you can deep, deep dive in the feature that you expect may be very interesting. Okay, so the understanding of this multi-material question, or I was saying earlier in this composites kind of question, composites of, let's say, soft and rigid materials or materials that might be more self-lubricating versus like very brittle and combining them is, again, a fabrication issue. So that's why in the soft robotics fields, people have been very interested in multi-material printing. What can you achieve with high resolution depositing of like soft and rigid materials right next to each other in an integrated manner? Because then you can reproduce this hybrid structure I was just mentioning, right? Because if you have a skeleton and you have a muscle, you want to bring those two things together to build a structure that has both rigid and soft combined in one and you want to avoid tedious assembly work, ideally, because if you really want to build an intricate structure that has a lot of these elements combined, assembly is not really an option anymore. It's either like just way too expensive, way too resource hungry that you cannot afford doing it, or it's just requiring literally like Swiss watchmaker skills to assemble it. And that's not... Uh, like a given so if you can just print it you can print something that has bones and muscles in one single print and you then just clean off your prints and it's ready to go to be a robot that's really a, a sweet feature and then if we can in, with this method explore the design space very quickly and come up with many different designs that we can test in reality because in the end of the day 
every simulator will always make errors in terms of its physics simulation. There will always be inaccuracies. So you only will really find out if your robot design that you built in simulation actually works in reality. You will only find that out by actually building it and trying it out. So multi-material printing is super crucial to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe I want to ask you for design space. If there's any trade-off, do you think? Because uh, at the beginning you mentioned uh, already, but I want to ask you if there is a trade-off you can't really avoid or maybe counterintuitive in, in terms of explaining why this behavior is happening or then the model it doesn't make sense to you or counterintuitive to your intuition. So in terms of design space and trade-offs, I, I think... If I understand the question correctly, there are so many problems to consider when you're building a system that very often some design ideas are just not feasible because they will not fit into the bigger picture. Because you could come up with an extremely nice muscle design that requires a lot of infrastructure surrounding it to even keep it A, actuating and B, alive. Like... Mm you like say let's say the field of soft robotics began i would say with fluidic actuators maybe some people could argue it was the tendon driven actuators but i think it really began with fluidic actuators meaning you have silicon structures that have hollow cavities and you fill them up with air so pneumatically actuated but the infrastructure behind that people very often didn't never show them in their papers they were maybe mentioned in a sentence There was a compressor standing somewhere and there was some array of valves or of pistons or some other means of pressurizing them. So you had this incredibly heavy and bulky and not very soft infrastructure. So you could maybe make a nice cripper. That cripper could never move around and it would have to have this huge compressor on the side that this cripper actually worked. And so really what comes down to the question of design trade-offs is can you build a design that can still work in a truly robotic autonomous mobile application you want to have a robot that can move around that can be at least be let's say on wheels at a minimum so it can actually support you because most applications that i could think of where a robot that is soft would really shine is in a human-centric environment and that means it cannot just be stuck in a corner of your household or of, of your of your facility that you have that robot deployed in, it ideally should be kind of variable and move around. So a soft robot will not survive or will not have a good, strong case to be made for a soft robot if it has all this extra bulk. And that's why one of the things that we're looking into is can we build muscles that are overall more efficient and that includes all of the infrastructure involved. You cannot just look in the end at the so-called actuator, the actual muscle, if you don't consider the energy source behind it that actually pressurizes or provides electrons or some other means to it. I'm glad you mentioned this point. And I want to ask you since, yeah, we already speak about concept about pneumatic actuation and maybe sometimes you're right, bulky. And the other techniques for actuation, why, maybe why do you think um, it still be used in the community if your case is really important point when it comes to application and applicability? What do you think of the motivation to still working on something maybe not really serving the end goal, being autonomous and applicable. I don't know if you have a view on that. Yeah, I mean, so if I can build a gripper that is made of completely soft materials, you can use that to have a lot of forgiveness when you pick up an object. And it doesn't really matter if you have a bulky pressurization set up behind it. Like I, I've been building soft arms, elephant trunk-like robotic arms that have many chambers that are nomadically actuated. And the infrastructure behind that it sits on a huge cart that is supplying all of, like I have an array of valves and I have a compressor there and all of that would never be portable. But in the end of the day, we could still say this is a good application where let's say I'm on the conveyor belt or I'm on something constrained or I'm the, in your kitchen hanging on the ceiling and mm-hmm. I'm doing some operations for you. In that scenario, I don't care if the actuator needs all of that infrastructure. It's completely fine that it doesn't need to be moving around. So the eventual goal might be to have completely mobile, like free roaming robots. But for now, 
I think it's fine to just be constrained to a space and show, can we do dexterous manipulation? Can we do interactions where I don't have to be worried about the robot maybe slapping me in the face if it has a malfunction? Because that slap in the face will not really hurt me and it will certainly not break my bones. So that's still a very viable direction where I would say I would not want to see a rigid robot as we know them maybe from from some of the like supreme robot manufacturers that are built with steel and with geared motors. I wouldn't want to have that one slapping in the face. Mm -hmm. Maybe from your lab, can you tell more about how you can really push the limit of the actuation? You mentioned already, but maybe what are maybe the the deep challenges do you think you mentioned fabrication etc but maybe in that design is based something interesting to fulfill all these desires and actuation how you push make sure you're pushing the limit here well i think i'm going multiple tracks in my lab i'm trying to not just double down on one actuation technology but be looking into many different actuation technologies so i have students assigned to different hypotheses of could a certain actuation technology be actually the viable technology that will be producing robots in the next five years that can really push the limits of what soft robotics can do. And so my current approach is really putting into my eggs into multiple baskets, I would say. It mm -hmm. will not just be working purely on fluidic actuation that's not the only way to go. There's other technologies that we're looking at that, in my opinion, have not really matured enough at the moment that we are not considering them yet. And that may be because there is not tools available we can just buy easily or there's not existing frameworks that we can just get going with them. So we are trying to build those frameworks to then, once we have a reasonable framework that we could consider to be good enough for roboticists to use, then it maybe changed the whole field. So once I have a new kind of muscle built with a new actuation technology, and I can provide to the fields everything it needs from the power source to the control of that muscle to being able to fabricate them in a shape and size that you need them for your application, then I think that new technology is suddenly viable. And fluidic actuation really needed that in the beginning when we go back 10 years again and fluidic actuation, so let's say these, these with air driven little, little crippers that were picking up eggs or they were crawling on the ground. It became suddenly feasible because there were manufacturers out there that were making silicone elastomer a commodity because people in special effects and in Hollywood, they were using them to build masks and all kinds of other static sort of things that humans could slip over their body and make them appear like, like a monster or like some... Hmm like some made up fantasy creature and the fact that they could use that and use it. So let's say it was affordable. It was easy to, to bring into shape that really enabled people to build soft robots in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And another thing that enabled people to build soft robots was insights just from chemistry and from let's say microfluidics was an important field that was influencing soft robotics. And just because we were using this technology of using silicones and soft lithography and these techniques suddenly kicked off fluid actuation. And now the next generation of actuators will need something similar. Either we have to produce that inside ourselves or we take inspiration from material scientists and from additive manufacturing specialists to actually kick it off. Yeah. Maybe a tensor close and a few question left. I want to ask you a view about the tensor design when it comes to complementing with actuation. How do you view tensor design? Do you think um, there's something maybe still missing in the community when it comes to designing good sensor, soft sensor? Uh, I don't know what you view about sensing for actuation. Yeah, yeah so for systems thinking, you need to do good sensing. For systems thinking, I mean... By systems thinking, I mean building a robot not only requires a good muscle, it also requires some way of perceiving the world. And that means the muscle itself needs to know about its own state. We would call that like the proper reception of the robot. And it also needs to be able to perceive the surrounding world through contact, through vision, and through sensing other modalities such as, let's say, heat, and those modalities, they all need to be captured with your robot. 
so we do have people in the group, at least in my group, and I know soft roboticists in the world, they are very interested in this question is, how do you integrate a sensor? What sensor modality to use? How many of them do you need in a single muscle? Or maybe you don't even put them into a muscle, you put them somewhere else in your robotic structure. And then what like, accuracy does this muscle, that this sensor needs in order to reproduce the, the overall state of your robot? So those questions are super important. And as a roboticist, you're looking into them. As a material scientist, you may be not. You may be just focused on the material for a muscle. Or you may be just focused on the material for a sensor. But as a roboticist, you're bringing those two things together. And that's actually what I find most exciting about robotics to begin with, is that we are allowed to have a good excuse to play with multiple interesting technologies to build one intelligent system. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Maybe also for redundancy, for actuation, because I think it's also interesting part about how you make sure there's redundancy and if there's failure or damage in a certain situation. How do you view redundancy in design here? Yeah, so very good question. <laughs> Like, I haven't seen much robots being published that had a lot of redundancy to them because the current state of research typically ends up in you build a robot that can do something for a couple of minutes or maybe sometimes even only seconds. And so the question of redundancy and therefore the question of, I would say, robustness is not quite uh, a main topic. But actually, like, if you think of a robot that is actually realistic to be used in real life and to be applicable to many situations it needs to be redundant in its actuation and in its sensing right so if one sensor breaks the other sensor somewhat needs to still be able to recover the state of the robot so when you're designing not only your muscles but you're also designing your patterning of your sensors in your robots let's think of let's say think of an arm with its biceps and its triceps and you put muscles in there and you want to have that arm move up and down through the actuation of those two muscles, you want to build in sensors that even if one of them rips because you have overstrained your, your arm setup, you still want to sense something. And the human is the same case. Like it, it will not just because it gets hurt suddenly not sense its arm anymore. It might not sense it as well anymore, but it can still overall reconstruct. And I do think one thing we need to always keep in mind is for this internal model that we humans build up over our own body. It's not just the sensing that we have, but we also have sort of like an, a, a, model, a model of our body overall. And with these few sensor nodes that we put onto our body, we can reconstruct the full motion of the arm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe I want to ask you, maybe what are maybe the vision or maybe the next question that you still want to answer in the coming years? You say, very interesting question. What your vision, the end goal? when you think about the design? So future looking, I do think, I want to answer the question of how can we really take the problem from, let's say, an evolutionary perspective. So could we build, could we build robots that can start off with a fairly simple architecture and then challenge them with simple tasks and see if they can then succeed in those tasks and then try to overcome more and more complex tasks. And as they're doing this, they're also rebuilding themselves. So if we mm -hmm. could reduce this in, in modeling, but also in reality, so we would have our digital twin here between what the modeling does and what the reality can do. And we so start off with simple tasks and it's keep trying at them and it's keep trying to get better at them and it's keep trying to see what's good about its own design and what's bad about its own design. And so if we can like from bottom up start with simpler examples, such as let's say simple crawling on the ground or just pushing a block, moving it back and forth and building up forces could be the simplest ones to start off with. And if we can then optimize the shape for that particular actuator, for that design, then we maybe can graduate from that stage to a more complex set of tasks. And so if we kind of build up this curriculum of tasks, starting with simple tasks to more intricate, more difficult or multi-level tasks, and we can then develop our 
muscles and our systems integrate with sensors and muscles based on that i think that would be really the, the thing i would love to explore more this question of can we reproduce and speed up evolution for our soft robots mm -hmm. and what makes you fulfilled satisfied maybe in research what makes you fulfilled and satisfied um I think fulfillment in research comes when I, it starts usually with the fulfillment I see in my students and my collaborators' eyes in some sense. Like as, as a professor, you have only limited time you can spend building the things yourself. So you're spending a lot of time thinking about the ideas or the principles behind them or kind of fusing insights gained that your students have created mostly and then moving it forward. But all of those insights can only be created if you have people who are excited about the research questions. If you have people like not coming to you and saying, hey, I really love the idea of building a soft robot. Or I really would like to build this kind of system. And I want to go the extra mile of trying out all these different possibilities here and put in the midnight oil to just do it and be excited about this. And if I don't have those people around me, nothing's going to happen. And in the end of the day, if there's no interest in it from the students and they rather build planes or something else, then may that be it. And then it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any fulfillment for me either. Because in the end of the day, it's a lot about teaching, right? It's a lot about bringing across certain first principles, bringing across certain visions and certain larger challenges, and then guides your students, advise them in a way that they can actually execute on those ideas. Mm -hmm. Lastly, I don't know if you received advice uh, was given to you and maybe life is changing. Well, stick to your mind. Advice was given to you. Oh, it has many interesting pieces of advice. But one of them, I would say, that really stick with me particularly strongly is the point of that it's always a win-win in any regards. I find it too often that people like they see the success from one person to be the loss for yourself. And I find that's actually not at all true in academia. Academia is actually driven by a purely win-win situation where we are all driven by publishing our works. And if someone else publishes something that you thought of and they do it maybe half as good as you thought of, or they might be three times as, as good as I see this as a win for everyone because you don't need to answer this question anymore. You can go ahead and do the more interesting question because we are so far away from the final goal anyways, that we don't need to be jealous about each other's progress, but we need to be encouraging about each other's progress. So it's really a win-win in the end, in any regards, And I find that particularly important when we review papers, when we um, have to judge grants, when we have to go through all of these processes. If people have like brilliant ideas and you feel like, oh, I have this idea too. Well, you should give them actually a particularly strong and positive review because if they have this idea and you can really resonate with this, this should really be rewarded. Or if they have a completely new idea that goes against your gut feeling, you should also think about it more critically and maybe say, oh, I may have been wrong about this all this way and I should actually reward this idea. Respect for that. I, I think that's very, very important message. I don't know if you have any final words you'd like to say for Soft Robots community or people listening to you. Any final words you'd like to say? Well, I, I'm excited to work on Soft Robots and I'm always very interested in these discussions like we have them today of, of seeing where could the field be going, what new ideas could we be following down to build better robots that can actually do good for humankind. So I'm always open for ideas of collaborations, for bringing completely new ideas of how to yeah, think about robotic systems. Because in the end of the day, the reason why we're not there yet where we are is because we just don't know yet. And so mm -hmm. thinking we have already all the means at our hands is completely a wrong way of thinking. We need to be open to new, thinking about new ideas, trying them out, and maybe then discard them once we've tried them out. And so always open for collaborations, always open to continue the discussions maybe that we touched on today. Mm -hmm.